Welcome to our Wednesday uh, 1130 Bible study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. You can uh, also pick up our, our studies out of doctrinalstudies.com. Uh, you can go there and get a printout of our lesson in case you haven't gotten it already. Uh, we're in a specific study uh, out of 1 Thessalonians, uh, the fifth chapter. The context is 12 through 28. If you have a study Bible, uh, it will talk about Christian conduct in time of crisis. And what is interesting in our previous study, we're now in our fifth lesson today in the study, Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. And uh, we're studying that based on the uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, crisis that we're in. And uh, not only are we in it in America, but everybody around the world, some 184 countries or so, are also suffering the same crisis. So I wanted to give you uh, some specific lessons as Christians under crisis. Now, you can learn it during this one that what's going to be applied to this crisis can be applied to all crises in your life. And what Paul did as he closed out the book of, of 1 Thessalonians is he did something really interesting. Now, I, I've, I taught this in my previous lessons. I'm just going to hit the highlights of it. But beginning with verse 13, he's going to go through down to through verse um, uh, 26. And he's going to list 17 imperative moods in the Greek language. That's a command. S the first 16 of these are in the present tense. That's a standing command. In other words, these are the things that are necessary for Christians to conduct themselves in a crisis in order to help other people in a crisis. Now, our lesson let not your heart be troubled, actually came from John 14, 1, when the disciples of Jesus was in a crisis uh, of death. Jesus was telling them he was going to leave, and they were, were rejecting that whole idea in verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Uh, in verse 27, he goes through and explains and gives them all the, the spiritual answers scripturally uh, to how to resolve the crisis. Uh, how to deal with it spiritually. They rejected it. So in verse 27, he says, let not your hearts be troubled nor fearful. What had happened between verse 1 and 27, as we explained in previous lessons, is what their fear had turned into panic. The rejection of the truth of God developed a fear in them that turned into panic. And so now they were fearful they were fearful of going to Bible study and listening to the truth of the word of God that was being given that would correct their problems of the crisis in their life. And they were rejecting it because it didn't fit their agenda. It didn't fit their viewpoint about Jesus Christ. So I went from there and dealing with our crisis here. I'm in verse, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read this. I'm in verse 14. And, and he's going to say, admonish the unruly. The word admonish is a present imperative. Encourage the faint-hearted. I spoke on that last week, a present imperative. And here's my lesson today. Help the weak. That's a present imperative. Help. The word help is a present imperative. Help the weak. And we're going to talk about that because this time there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be weak. They're going to be emotionally weak. They're going to be financially weak. They're going to be physically weak. Many are going to suffer during this crisis in a lot of different ways. This command is given to those of us who have the spiritual answers to the crisis of life, such as I'm giving today. Help the weak. Now, the word help, help, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how it how we could help physically, how we could help emotionally, how we could help spiritually, uh, all these different ways of helping people depending on where their crisis level is manifesting itself. So in a moment, that's where we're going to go, help the weak in a time of crisis. 
But first, I need to have a word of prayer. And before I do that, is to remind you the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in a Christian life is personal sin. Could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do we get out of carnality and back to spirituality in the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit? I have to confess my sin. Because the work of Christ on the cross in verse 7 of 1 John, 1 John 1 9, confess your sin. In 1 John 1 7, you get cleansed. When Christ did his work on the cross, cleansed me from Adam's sin, Romans 5 12 through 21. It also, when I believe, it also cleanses me to restore me to spiritual, not salvation. Not salvation, like Romans talking about Adam's sin. Not salvation, but spirituality. Confession of my sin restores me to spirituality, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, why that's important, and why I say this before I study, is that the Holy Spirit who indwells your life is there to teach and recall, John 14, 26. The word of God. He'll teach it to you and he'll recall it to you and from you to others. That's really important. So the principle is confess your sin. Carnality. How do we get out of carnality and spirituality? I got to confess my sin. And you must do it before you learn it. And you learn the Bible to live it. And you live it to share it. And so it's a very important principle. And so we learn it every time we come to church. And... So I'm going to request that of you. I'm going to request that of you. So I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. You are a believer priest. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. Because this is the new covenant church age. So I give you a moment to confess your sins. Mental attitude type, sins of the tongue, overt sins need to be confessed. And so our Father, we thank you today for these who have Come to study with us through the internet, Facebook, whatever. And I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister because they've been obedient to the word of God. Confess your sin. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That restores us to spirituality. And we're so thankful for that, Father. So thankful for it. Not just to have the cleansing, but what the cleansing does for me is puts me back into a spiritual mode of operation and thinking and operating the Christian life. Especially true for Bible study when the Holy Spirit's responsibility, according to John 14, 26, is to teach and recall the Word of God. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Teach us today, Father, in, in your Son's name. Amen. Well, here we are. I want, I want you to pay attention uh, to the word uh, help the weak. It made up of two Greek words. Two Greek words. The word help the weak is given to the believer to help someone else. And what's interesting about the word weak, and we'll get to it in a moment in the Greek language, it has the concept behind it about being a good neighbor. Be a good neighbor. To be a good neighbor in the word help the weak. To be a good neighbor in helping the weak, you have to set your interests aside in order to focus on meeting the other person's needs. Now, it's very important you get that because that's the word help the weak. And that's very important that you understand that. It's about being a good neighbor, like the Good Samaritan. Be a good neighbor. Be a good neighbor. A good neighbor is one who is concerned with the interests of, of others over themselves when he finds them in a crisis of life. The Good Samaritan of uh, Luke 10 is a good example of that. Uh, three, three people were involved in a crisis in another man's life. Only one was able to help the weak. That's a story you should go back and look at to encourage you to be a helper of the weak. And so I want us to focus on it. Remember the word help is a present imperative. That's a standing command in our life. Even when we're busy and on an important uh, business trip, like the Samaritan in the story of the Good Samaritan, 
He set aside his own interest to take care of the interests of another who was in need. I mean, in desperate need. He was lying in the street, half dead, and treated by others, religious people, who walked around him as if he was another casualty of the street like, a, like an animal. And so that's kind of the background or backdrop to this concept of being a good neighbor in regard to this idea of help the weak. Help the weak. Remember, it's in the series, not let your hearts be troubled. Because it's got to first to apply to you so that you can apply it to another. Let me begin, begin by speaking to my congregation, those who... Uh, who listen to me on a regular basis, you may be in another state or another country, but you do listen to me on a regular basis. I consider you part of those my congregation. Let me begin by saying I'm confident that the congregation that I minister to at Doctrinal Studies Bible Church is reaching out to our community, the Birmingham area, their church family, and their personal families. I am very confident of that. I have a spiritual mature people, and that's the norm and standard of a spiritual mature person. That's what, that's what Paul is trying to get over to the church at Thessalonica. That's, what, that's exactly why he's writing 1 Thessalonians. That's really important that you understand that. Uh, President Trump, in talking about the present crisis we're in, COVID-19, COVID said that he thought we, he was fighting an invisible war. He felt he was the commander-in-chief of a war, of an invisible war. I really relate to that because the Church of Jesus Christ, every day of their life, is in an invisible war. If you're, if you're not familiar with that, we call it the angelic conflict. If you're not familiar with that idea, then go to Ephesians one day, Chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, and read it, because we all fight. I, I feel my responsibility in commander-in-chief or the chief shepherd of my people to prepare them for the invisible war they all fight every day. And it, that involves a lot of crises. Warfare, warfare, warfare has a lot of casualties. And... Uh, we have to be, I believe, my church, our front line workers. I believe that with all my heart. Just as much as the doctors and the nurses and all these other wonderful people are going out every day putting their self in the invisible war. I believe that for my people. We teach that. We teach that. And I believe they're heroes. I think they do it every day because they understand it. They don't. There's no end to our work. We're hopeful and we're prayerful that there will be an end to this crisis of disease. But we fight an invisible war every day, 724s. And it will be that way till, the, till Jesus comes again. It is what we are saved for and still here on the earth. Now let me talk a little bit. The first Greek word. It, the word help. It's a compound word in the Greek language. It's made up of anti, A-N-T-I. It's made up of anti, and it's made, of, made up of echo. But in this case, it's echo my, uh, echo myo, echo maya. And that's really important because it ends in an O-M-A-I, and that makes that a middle voice. So this is a present middle imperative, second person plural, speaking to the congregation. It's made up of two words. The word anti means against. And the word echo means to help or hold. To help and hold. If you looked at it literally, it would literally refer to someone holding, so holding something against oneself. The, the deponent, we call that a deponent middle because it ends in an O-M-A-I, a, a middle, which means 
that the form is middle, but the function is active. <laughs> and the middle is reflexive to the subject. You help. And you've got to do that within, you've got to make choices within yourself. You've got to make those kind of choices when you come to Bible study and study to prepare yourself to be a help, to be a helper of the weak. And listen, he's going to give you, he's going to give you 17 imperatives. This is not the only thing he's told his people to do. This is one of 17. So it's important you understand that. Now, when you look at the, the present middle imperative, second person plural, it refers to the congregation, every member of the congregation. It means that every member of the congregation, as he spiritually develops his soul capacity to live the Christian life functionally in the world, that he must concern himself with the interests of others over his, his own. Now, sometimes you can actually plan it. You can plan to take a meal to somebody or to take, pick up groceries for them and take them. Sometimes you can plan it. And then sometimes, like the Samaritan on a business trip, you can't. All of a sudden, there's a car wreck or there's a, a, a mugging. And all of a sudden, you got somebody laying in the middle of the road who is half dead. What a strange way to say half dead. I mean, he's holding on by, by the string of life. And, and listen, two religious people walked around him, and for all practical purpose, what little string of life he had left, they just cut it by doing nothing. But the good Samaritan, who was on a, a busy, fast business trip, set his interest aside to help the weak. So sometimes a crisis comes in another person's life. Sometimes you're familiar with it, can plan it and take care of it. Sometimes it comes out of the wild blue. And it catches you unprepared unless you are spiritually paying attention with what you're learning in class, like today's lesson. When you learn this lesson, God is going to put it out on the front line of your life. When you learn this lesson today, and you should learn it to be a frontline worker in the visible warfare. You're going to have the opportunity to use it. That's why it's a present middle imperative. No better example, I suppose, could I give you than the ministry. I gave you one. That's the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Another one would be the example out of Matthew of the life of Christ. In Matthew 8, now, do you think he had to make choices? Who should I heal? Who should I not? What should I do? What should I do? You suppose he didn't make it? Yes, of course. He had to live by the word of God. He had to study. I mean, he, he, didn't, he had to study. If you study the life of Christ from birth all the way up to ministry, and we have highlights, we know his birth, we know when he was 12, and we know when he was 30. And when he was 12, he was spiritually growing. When you look at Luke, Luke the second chapter, verse 42 and 50, you see that he had to develop spiritual maturity like you and I. Because it has to be applied volitionally. He went to the cross because he had volition. He had to make a choice. Gethsemane shows it. Sometimes your choices are not really easy. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're really difficult. He prayed. He prayed until sweat turned to blood. Well, in the story, I want to show you the example of help the weak. It's found in Matthew, the 8th chapter, 14 through 17. I'm just going to tell it to you. You write it down. Read it later. Jesus has gone home to the life of Peter that apparently they're going to have a fish fry. I don't know. Peter was a fisherman. What do I know? But when they got to the house, which was early day, maybe lunchtime, 
when they got there. And they're apparently going to spend the evening. His mother-in-law was sick. And she was running high fever. Now, we know in most disease cases, high fever is contagious. So, you know, everybody's going to, you know, nobody has to tell you when somebody's high fever and coughing and sneezing and wheezing, tell you to step back six or seven, eight feet. Sometimes people walk away from it completely. But I'll tell you what he did. He stepped into the midst of the fire. He stepped into the middle of the temperature to help the weak. You know what he did? He touched her hand. He didn't touch her forehead. He touched her hand. And she was completely well. Oh, I don't mean had to be in quarantine for 14 days. I mean she was completely 100% well. 100% consent, consent. Now, when she got there, she couldn't get out of bed. Now, she feels wonderful. Now, this is not some medicine she took, and tomorrow she's going to have to go through it again. She got a little bit. You know, she got a shot, and you know how you feel? Get a cortisone shot or something, and how you feel really good, and the next day it catches up with you? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. She is cured of that disease. Whatever got her is never going to get her again because she's been touched by the master. You know where disease comes from? It comes from Adam's sin. You know where death comes from? Adam's sin. You know who solves both of those? The Lord Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross is sufficient for both of those crises. That's what he told the disciples in John 14, 1. <laughs> yes, he did. Let me tell you what happened. Are you ready for this? When the evening came and they were ready to relax and kick back and do whatever a bunch of preachers do when they get together, The whole community came out. The whole community came to Peter's house. You know why? They wanted to be touched by the master's hand. <laughs> Who doesn't? What smart person in the whole wide world would want to be touched by the master's hand when, when he can merely touch a person, they can be healed from that issue forever? Do you know that that's your Savior? Do you know that that's who you represent when you go to help the weak? Do you not know that you have the authority in the name of Jesus to pray over people for healing and get healing? Because they can be touched by the Master. And boy, you should have seen who they brought that evening to Jesus. The whole community, what started in one little house, has spread to a whole community. When you read that, you will see that they brought all sorts of demon-possessed people that needed healing, and all sorts of sick people that needed healing. You know where demon possession comes from? Being lost, rejecting the truth of Christ. This is the substitute. Satan is there to substitute. Satan is the great master of substitute. He masquerades like an angel of light. But he's the pit of the darkness of hell itself. How about that? Here's what's interesting in that story. Don't miss this. When Jesus gets through that evening touching all of these people and helping the weak, 
He gave them a Messianic Bible verse. He quoted Isaiah 53, 4. Anybody who is familiar with Messianic prophecies of his first coming are very familiar with Isaiah 53. It's one of the great Messianics of the crucifixion of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, when Paul says, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, Old Testament. He was, and that he was buried and he was raised from the dead, according to the scriptures, Old Testament. He's talking about this. He's talking about Isaiah 53. He's talking about Psalm 16. He quotes Isaiah 53, 4 here. He quotes it. And he says, this is a sign of Christ. Who can do these things? Who can do this? Who, who can do this? Who can touch and be completely healed? Who can do that? The Messiah, the Christ. But why did Christ come? To touch the sick, to heal the... No, he came for the lost. He didn't come for the sick. He came, listen... He touched the sick to show he had come for the lost. He touched the sick to show he had come for the lost, dear heart. Who are the lost? See, you haven't read Luke 19.10. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the lost, for the unrighteous. Who are they? They're, that's every person born under Adam's sin. That's every member of the human race, Romans 5, 12-21. He touched, he touched a sick person in order to reach a, to say, I'm the Messiah that's come to save the lost. John said, behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of his people. He touched the sick to deal with sin of the soul, not to deal with the sickness of the body. We can help the weak both in the body and the soul through the gospel of Jesus Christ, by, by being a, a, a good helper to the weak. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore. Surely our sorrows he carried. Yet we were self esteemed him, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He who touched the sick to save their soul was stricken, smitten, and afflicted on the cross. All their sickness and all the disease and all of the death associated with Adam's sin. The blood of Christ covers it. Oh, I wish you would understand that today. Isaiah 53, 4, what a wonderful, what a wonderful night. I wonder how many of those people, Jewish people, that had been touched by the master's hand in Matthew 8, cried crucify him in Matthew 27. I wonder about you and me. Peter never cried crucify him. But he betrayed him. Now betrayal is a comes in many forms, doesn't it? The second word, that's the word weak. Help. That was the word help. Help, help the weak. Now, here's the word weak. The word weak has an A on the front of it. That's an alpha privative, and it means without in the Greek language. And then staneo, staneo, staneo is the word strength. Strength. That could be moral strength. It could be spiritual strength. It could be physical strength. 
It could be political strength. It could be military strength. It's the word strength, and it means strong. It means being able to, to max out your capacity. Young guys will go to the gym, and if they're athletically inclined, they want to max out their strength. No pain, no gain concept. That's the word I'm talking about. And the per word weak is a person who has lost his capacity for strength, whether it be in any of these areas, moral, spiritual, physical, whatever. It's kind of an interesting word. Here's something that's missed. There's a definite article with it. This is a participle that's in our text. It's a present active participle, nominative, singular, masculine, and it's articulate. It has a definite article. The word the is with it. It's not translated the because there's a participle. It's translated the one who because it's singular, the one who. Now watch this. You're missing this. My job is to pick it up. You see the word help? with second person plural. The word weak is singular. It's not but the singular masculine. We're all to do this. And there are a lot of different ways to be weak. But when we come upon them, we are to help the weak, like the Good Samaritan or like Jesus, like so many other examples. They don't have the strength. Listen, the Samaritan that found the Jew laying on the street the other Jews would not mess with, would not take the time out of their busy schedules, wouldn't get their hands dirty. This man took the time. This man took the time. Because this man was weak. He couldn't get on his feet. He, he, the Bible says he was half dead. It means he couldn't bring anything. There was nothing in him left for him to live. There's nothing he could do for himself to live. And if left, the other half would die. Three people knew that. Two walked away from it. And one walked away from his own life to take care of it. That's what I'm talking about. So I want to give you, I want to give you some ideas about this word, weak. First, this word weak refers to lacking the strength to perform a necessary task, as I mentioned. It could be physical. It could, be, for example, the inability to prepare a meal dress themselves or take a bath, go to a store, a doctor's appointment, clean house, take care of the yard. See, there are a lot of ways you could describe it. Or they could be sick and need to go to the hospital and can't, can't get there, can't, can't dial 911. And we need to respond to that. I mean, can we, can, can we take care of that? Could we bring a meal? Could, could we go help dress? Could we go bathe? Could we go to the store for this person? Could we take them to a doctor's appointment? Could we clean their house? Could we take care of the yard? What are the physical things connected to them? Can we buy them a pair of glasses because the glasses they have they can't see through and all they need is an eye exam? And then we find out they have cataracts. Can we help them? Can we help the weak? You're going to walk past it when you know that that needs to be taken care of? You're going to pass the buck, pass it down the line, and let somebody else deal with it? When they can't deal with it themselves and you know they can't, whose responsibility is it? Come on, church. Whose responsibility is it? You have a standing command to take care of that. It fell in your court. You take care of it.
James 5.14. Here's the second. Weak could be the lack of strength to perform a necessary task because you're under divine discipline. <laughs> I bet you never thought about that. You could be under divine discipline and you can't perform your normal task. Oh, yeah. You can find this in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 5 through 12, where it talks about divine discipline on a believer's life because of unconfessed sin. And you could read 1 Corinthians eleven thirty, 30, where, where if you take part in the Eucharist with willful sin in your life, you will become, the Bible says, you will become weak, sick, and sleep. That's a euphemism for dying, a believer dying. See the word weak? That's our word. The word weak is our word. Now, how are you going to help that person? You're going to pray for them, and then you're going to go have a talk. You're going to help the weak, the spiritually weak, who is in a carnal state in his life and under discipline and won't, won't confess his sin. You're going to have to go have what I call a come-to-Jesus meeting with him. Whose responsibility is it? Well, I'll call the pastor. <laughs> no, that's the second call you make after you've made the visit. I don't mind going in, but I go in second, not first. You don't pass the buck when the buck has been passed to you. The Lord gave you the mission. You're assigned to the mission. You are under the standing command. If he will not listen to you, you bring it back to the church. If he will not listen to you, then you come, you come get one of the pastors. We've got several in this church. You come back and get one. I'd be more than glad to go. Here's the third one. This word, weak, refers to lacking strength to perform a spiritual task. Because of immaturity, you're weak in faith. Immaturity. You don't lack it. You're weak in it. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of this. Paul goes on his first missionary trip with Barnabas. This is Acts 13 and 14. Barnabas wants to take his cousin, John Mark, with him who is a young guy who Barnabas believes has the gift and wants to get involved, engaged in ministry. And this trip, he thinks, would be a good trip for him. And he talks to Paul, and Paul says, well, all right, but I don't know. You know, I don't know. Is he spiritually mature enough to handle the stress of being on the front line of warfare? I mean, has he been properly trained to go into the the heat of the battle? Well, Barnabas says, I, I don't know, but he needs the experience and he needs to be mentored by uh, mature guys and let's take him along. They do. And John Mark is not up for the, the task. He wasn't up for it. And uh, Paul shipped him and sent him back home. John Mark was weak in his faith due to immaturity. Not through bad choices, just immaturity. But listen to me. Paul, who was a mature believer, handled John Mark wrong. Now look, I'm on, I'm on thin ice. I know that. Ron Ada from Podunk, Michigan, taking on the Apostle Paul. But I say that because Paul acknowledged it later. Let me give you the, let me give you the scripture. Let me find that thing here. In uh, uh, John Mark. Well, anyhow, it's somewhere. I gave it to you somewhere in there on your paper. Uh, 
it, later in the book of Acts, Paul does it. He acknowledges he treated him wrong. You know why? Because he was weak in faith. John Mark was weak in faith. He was weak, weak in faith not because, not because he was making bad choices. He was just because he was immature. He was green behind the ears. Barnabas had a great idea about doing it. Barnabas shouldn't have thrown him in because they were going to war. They weren't going to a movie about war. They were going to war. Barnabas made a mistake. He didn't evaluate weak in faith. And Paul, in the midst of it, didn't handle weak in faith. He's a mature believer who didn't help the weak in faith. If you want to read more on this subject matter by Paul's writing about it, of how we should handle what he didn't handle well, but learn later how to do it well and apologize to Mark, John Mark later, you could read Romans 14.1 and Romans 15.1. The spiritual strong, Paul writes, the spiritually strong should bear the weaknesses, that's our word, of those without spiritual strength and not just please ourselves. See, Paul made it easier. Listen, packed him up and sent him home. It was easier on Paul. And Paul didn't set his own interests aside. He's help the weak means that. Help means set your interests, your own interest aside for the interest of others because God has assigned you to do it. I hope you understand that. I hope you understand that. My, my third point. The spiritually advancing believer can be spiritually weak because they operate under the power of the sin nature, lust flesh, rather than walking in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I gave you a lot of passages on that. Matthew 26, 41 is one. It says the spirit, referring to the human spirit, the human spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Listen to me. The flesh is always weak. <laughs> Even when it says it's strong, it's weak. Example, Peter. Jesus says, uh, you're all going to betray me. Peter says, oh, not me, Lord. You see, his spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. Jesus said, when the, when the rooster crows in, in tomorrow morning, in, tomorrow morning when the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. See, Peter wouldn't, Jesus wanted to help him. He wouldn't take help. He tried to help the weak and he wouldn't take the help. And so he told him, well, then the rooster will have to help you because I can't. And in the morning, rooster crowed and the rooster helped him because then he knew he was weak in faith. You see, the human spirit can be willing, but the flesh is always weak. If you're looking for the flesh to give you help, no. That's why the God gave you the Holy Spirit to overcome the flesh. Because the strength of the flesh is still weakness. You see, the flesh is weak. That's our word. Weak. It is weak. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, 29, Paul says, Who was led into sin without my intense concern? Now, when God brings you to somebody who has been led into sin and he's into sin up to his eyeballs, what's your concern? Well, it's none of mine, Ron. Well, listen to what Paul said. Who is led into sin without my intent Concern.
In Luke, the 22nd chapter, verse 31, 32, Peter again. Don't mean just to pick on Peter, but. Peter wouldn't listen to him. Jesus saw he was weak in faith, tried to help him. And Peter, refusing to believe it, wants to get a little up in Jesus' faith, face about stuff. You know, he's, he's like a, a friend of mine that said one time explaining the choices he had made. He said, I was all mixed up and permanently set like concrete. I thought that was, a, being a construction man, I thought that was an interesting analogy. Jesus finally said to Peter, he said, well, Peter, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. But let me tell you something, Peter. I've gotten a note from heaven on you. And I am obligated to tell you this and let it be what it be. Satan has requested permission to sift you like wheat and has been granted his request. And when you get through with that experience, Peter, and come back to faith, and now have learned the experience, I want you to be a helper of the weak in faith. I want you to strengthen the brethren. What was Jesus doing? He was helping the weak. He wasn't trying to beat them up. He wasn't trying to be judgmental. He was trying to be helpful. A spiritual counselor concerned, deeply concerned over the sin and what it will do to them. What do you mean it's not your business? It's the business of Jesus Christ, and he's taken you and put you into business. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in the business. Peter signed up to be a follower of Christ. He's in the business. He's in, this, he's in the business of dealing with sin, both in his own life and the life of others. And he's got to be honest in both areas. Let me conclude. The spiritual advance and believer can be weak in faith because of old man Cosmos Diabolicus thinking in certain areas of his life. Not all over his life, but certain areas. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Put off the old man and put on the new. Peter's going to have to do that. He wasn't an immature person. He was operating off of a belief system that was wrong. And he thought it was right. And Jesus couldn't tell him it different. He wouldn't listen. That's why so many people around here have left. They just left. I've not changed the teaching I teach. I'm the same guy I was 45 years ago when I walked into this church, into this pulpit. If you know anything about me, I'm, I preach the same stuff. And it changed. I've grown up. If there's any change in this pulpit, it's because I've matured in it. Listen. Peter is stuck into old man thinking, worldly thinking. He thinks he has scripture for it, but the scripture won't hold water. 
You will never get into transformational living for Christ, Romans 12, 2, until you deal with some core issues in your life of why you are weak in faith in certain areas. Well, I have a bad temper. Oh, I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Peter. You're going to get sifted like wheat until you come to recognize you are weak in faith. And you've got to learn how to strengthen your faith so that you can teach others. Did you know that? Did you know that? We are told in closing, we are told to accept the one who is weak in faith for restoration, not for criticism. You don't try to help somebody out, they won't do it, and then you become critical, judgmental. You're always trying to help somebody for restoration, no matter what the restoration, whether it's moral or spiritual or physical or what it's spiritual, whatever. We are told to accept the one who is weak in faith. Why? Because that's the way we were accepted. We do it because that's the way Christ received us. Romans 14, 1, 17 through 20. Pay attention to verse 19. Okay. What you're trying to do is rescue, rescue so that they can begin to build up their Christian life. They can get involved in edification rather than tearing down. They can learn to build their life up rather than tear it down, build it up, tear it down. See, that's the way most Christians live. They get into Bible study, they build it up. Then they get into carnality, build it, they tear it down, build it up, tear it down, build it up, tear it down. What kind of a life is that? Very little occupancy. You build a house and tear it down, build a house, tear it down, build a house, tear it down. We are told to bear the weakness of others, especially those who are without strength, and not to please ourselves. I'm going to close with who is weak without me becoming weak for them. Not to identify with their sin, but to identify with the Savior. I don't have to identify with their weakness of sin or whatever. I have to identify with the Savior, who over, the overcomer, who is able to touch them and heal them. Holy. Treat the, the whole person, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Let us pray. Well, Father, we're thankful today for those that have come with us on Wednesday at our 1130 lunch. Except we don't have lunch right now because we can't gather because of an edict. But, Father, we're here by the Internet. And we thank you for it, for we're able to stay in touch and encourage our people and others who have visited with us. And I hope will stay with us in our discussion out of 1 Thessalonians 5. Today, it's help the weak. And my people, I ask you to Help the week this week and next week and for the rest of your life. I'm asking you to put this into, into motion. He will give you the opportunity. He will give you the opportunity. Be alert for it. Be a helper of the week. In Jesus' name, amen.